So my name is Todd Dumond. Um, our farm is, is Dumond Ag. And uh, we have a, a variety of businesses. We do some grain processing and some trucking. But uh, when it all boils down to it, we're a farm. Still a family farm. Uh, we're slowly growing. We're about 4,500 acres now. Um, primarily corn and soybeans. We do a little bit of wheat uh, to allow for some management, some grid tiling, uh, kind of land improvement through the late summer. Uh, we do a lot of trials, a lot of research, uh, different crop production technologies and whatnot. Um, doesn't ever seem like the equipment does quite what you want it to or how you want it to, so we end up always tweaking almost everything we get and, and trying something new. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, been with uh, using variable rate. We, we kind of uh, took a step up in our farm in 2006, started collecting yield data at that point and um, had to wait a few years before we had enough data and en enough know-how to do it. But we've been doing variable rate application for four, five, six years now, something like that, since 2010. So, uh, so the, the kind of focus of this is managing climate change. And I think uh, my talk here is, is how do we manage crop production with respect to climate change? And when I hear people talk about climate change or what climate change means to me is just increased volatility in the weather. Um, obviously, we have no control over that. All we can do is set ourselves up to succeed best with whatever Mother Nature gives us. Um, so we have operate, you know, I'll discuss some operational practices, some nutrient application timing, stability. There's a lot of new resources available to us. Uh, I fall back on, I'll touch base on this a lot, that uh, understanding soil. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing we can do to manage climate change, to manage intense rains, um, droughts, you know, those sort of severe weather events. I think the only way, or one of the main ways we can, we can do that is understanding what we start with. Um, when I think about my crop, the soil is the only thing that I know is going to be consistent year to year to year. It's, it's, it's a very slow process to change, improve, or decrease. Well, I've, you can have erosion very quickly and degrade your soils very quickly. But uh, for the most part, it's the most stable thing. You know, the amount of rain, the amount of heat, the amount of sun, when we plant, when we harvest, we have very little control over that. Um, but we uh, can understand our soil. So I'll come back to that numerous times throughout the presentation. And then I think variety placement. Um, that's probably one of the areas in agriculture that most of the research is done, most of the progression. I feel very strongly, I'll show some slides that talk about the potential of uh, variety placement. I think that's, that's got huge potential for our production. So um, know your goal, develop a process uh, necessary to achieve it. So these are just some, some pieces of equipment that we have used, ran, bought, modified on our farm to kind of accomplish our goal. Uh, it's kind of coming back to they don't always make what you need. Um, so this here is a strip till that we modified, I guess. Um, we went to 20 inch rows uh, for a lot of reasons. We'll touch base, kind of erosion control, optimization, uh, efficiency, uh, soil use. Uh, but no, we made a strip till. We wanted a strip till for you know erosion control, basically. So we built a 20 inch strip till. We wanted to apply our fertilizer in the strips below the crop, stabilize so it's right there when the crop needs it, where it's going to get to it. So we basically took two or three machines, molded them into one. This thing down here is an Irish planter. Um, you plant under mulch film. It's a 100% biodegradable uh, film. And it grows, gains you about 300 growing degree units. So you can plant early, gives you frost protection. You can plant a fuller season corn in a shorter climate. Uh, I have some partners that are still running this tool. It's working very, very well for them in Wisconsin. Um, we ran it three years ago. Uh, it was a late. And uh, we had a lot of problems getting it through customs. And uh, basically, we planted too late with it, and our corn got burned. So we needed to be about a month earlier. So it did not work real well, but we understand why. Is the corn growing through the plastic? Yeah. Or? Yeah. It actually grows up to probably V4, V5, and then breaks through. It'll actually curl under, and you'll get the stalk po poking up through. And then once the stalk pokes through, the leaves pop back open. So it gives you about a month of protection. Uh, and then it stays, you know, it. Uh, yeah, well, to a degree, to a degree. I mean, it's also warming the soil and keeping the moisture. And you get a lot of condensation on the inside of the plastic, so it kind of uh, self-watering. It also has holes. There's different color. Um, 
There's different color films. Uh, I think this is the green. Um, the different colors are the kind of the half-life of the film. And there's um, actually, this is, there's two 30-inch rows under here. So here's a row. You'll see the kind of um, uh, groove where it's planted in here. And uh, there's actually holes over top of the corn to allow some respiration and allow the, the plant to break through. Some colors have slots, some colors have holes, some col so colors have a lot of holes, some colors have pretty sporadic holes. It all depends on the goal that you're trying to achieve. And then the main difference is the half-life of how, how quickly they break down. So, uh, per Precision agriculture, I'm gonna come back to this a lot. Uh, this is basically, I'm gonna touch on this as a, it's a very general, I have another talk I can do about precision agriculture. I kind of break it into two parts, machine control and then data management and utilization. Boy, we won't talk about the machine control very much at all in um, this talk. We'll talk about more of the use of the data and how to make smart cropping decisions. So, um, challenging though, and uh, this, I really stand by this. Do we truly understand how to maximize returns using variable rate? I, I think the answer is no. I don't even think we're close to it. I have all sorts of hypotheses I've tried and different ideas and you know, I think, oh, this is good. This is gonna have a real direct correlation. It's gonna be very highly predictable. And, you know, I go through a year or two of trials and there's no correlation. So I think there's a ton of learning. And I think anybody that tries to sell you an algorithm or a formula and says it's gonna work is, is uh, probably blowing a lot of smoke. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, there's a lot of people working on it. There's a lot of work going forward. I think we're making great progress, but I think it's tremendously challenging. Uh, we did uh, initiate a research project uh, based on um, some of these things, uh, underlying things, with New York Corn and Soybean Grower Association three years ago. The goal of this project is to try and understand soil, soil variability and how to um, optimize varietal placement and population dependent on soil characteristics. So coming back to my statement that soil characteristics are one thing we know will be relatively constant for the the uh, future years, and uh, we can measure them and then um, manage accordingly. Uh, the the kind of second, third stage will be nitrogen management, and then nitrogen stability is where we see the the um, priorities with this project going. So we've uh, we have like three, well, we're probably up to four or five thousand acres under trial uh, through this project. Um, we just kind of. Uh, partnered with Professor Gore here at Cornell to start doing some of the statistical analysis. It can be very, very um, complex uh, and tremendous amounts of data. I think we have something like eight or 900 um, comparisons and thousands and thousands of data points. So, you know, trying not to mine the data is uh, challenging. So we finally found um, Cornell as a good partner to, to start working on that. We've had very few results. Um, over the last three years because we don't have enough power to really generate anything useful. So this will be the completion of our third year. We think we'll have somewhere where we can get started. Um, so soil properties. Um, there's a variety of ways you can collect data. The Veris uh, tool, Veris is a company. They produce this tool. It does uh, electric conductivity. I think if I hit this again, you're gonna get some little arrows. Does, measures organic matter and measures pH uh, of a soil real time, on the go, very, very high resolution. Uh, for the research project, we run this at um, about four miles an hour, 40 foot intervals. Uh, you get a lot of samples. The uh, organic matter and the EC, the organic matter is actually right up here. You can barely see it. EC is here. They're constant. They're taking a few readings every second. The pH is a boot here that actually takes a core soil pulls it up against the sensor here and cycles. It's about a 30 second cycle time. So you may get, uh, you know, roughly 10 samples an acre. So it's even, even at that it's relatively high resolution, not nearly as high as the um, EC organic matter. Yes. How deep do you go with that? With the boot? Um, the boot we probably, you know, it's variable. It, we go probably max, the bottom of the boot's probably six inches. You know, the dirt runs about right in here. There's a roughly two inch hole in it. Um, it comes down, pulls up, you know, it kind of mixes a lot. So it's, it's in that, um, that tillage sort of range. How about the EC? 
the easiest, the dual array EC, so one measurement is a 0 to 18, another is 18 to 36 inches. And the organic matter runs, it's a planar row unit basically, it's got a, a two photo eyes, or infrared eyes behind it, so you run that about two inches. Try and get at your seed depth for the organic matter. Obviously you move up or down much, you're gonna change. But I think the idea is you, you wanna take the, the, the majority of the readings in the soil that you turn, because if you're turning it, it's kinda homogeneous theoretically. And then uh, grid sampling. This, um, this is a custom built tool from a company in Ohio. It's called Integrated Ag. It's one of the most reliable and um, grid sampling tools that I've seen. These guys can cover a thousand acres in a day pretty easily uh, on a half acre grid. Uh, basically there's the same sort of, this is actually the boot right here. Drops down in, takes a core of the top six or eight inches cycles up, it's in the up position now, it kicks it out into this yellow box where it is scanning barcodes on sampling trays, logging them, logging the GPS position of it. So uh, he can move right along like 10 miles an hour and uh, pull samples. Uh, we've had him do half acre grids. Um, and then you can get the whole ray. It's just like sending any soil sample to a lab. You could get 50 different you know, micronutrients, PK, whatever you want. Uh, so it's a great tool. Uh, it's more reliable than that Varus tool. That thing is impossible to run. If you can get over 50 acres in a day, you have a good day. You got to pat yourself on the back. And it probably takes you three days to get that 50 acres, to be honest. Uh, this thing runs. So the data, you get more diverse data here. Um, you get more acres, but you don't get the resolution. So there's trade-offs. Uh, in New York, this is not high enough resolution. We ran it on 1,000 acres of our farm last year, and we're missing all sorts of inclusions at a half acre grid. So you'd find that hard to believe. Most people think a half acre grid is, is really high resolution. It just doesn't cut it. So. Uh, some soil properties, this kind of, just this map of the EC, you see a real low EC here, high here. It's kind of, oh, again, if I think I hit, it's kind of backwards here, organic matter. The optics mapper is one of the organic readings. Um, so you can see the variability. This is not a large field, probably a 10 acre field quite a bit of variability. I know there's no scale or anything, it's just more showing the resolution. So, um, yield data. Um, I guess what I'm kind of going through this presentation, stepping through, giving you the background, and then I'll kind of have a more fundamental discussion of how I think we can use this data and whatnot. So I want to give everybody an understanding of how we can collect data, because if you don't have good data, there's no sense looking at it or working with it or analyzing it. So. Uh, yield data, most combines, new combines have it. New, new choppers are starting to have good yield mapping data. Uh, you need a lot, of, uh, a lot of yield data, a lot of years to overlay because this yield map is only representative of this year. You know, if it was a real, this is one of my fields, this is a 126 acre field. Um, it's, uh, it's overall a very good field. This area right in here. Last year I took uh, 260 bushel corn off it with 180 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, this area right here is a ridge that uh, will probably do pretty well this year with all the rain, but in a dry year, I'll be lucky to get 40 bushels off of it. Uh, I got, we have over 13 different soil types in this field. We've done a lot of our work on this field because the variability is there. Um, so it's a real good um, place to do trials and learn. Um, but like I said, in a dry year, this area really struggles. In a wet year, it's going to do well because right? all it really needs is water. It doesn't have much crop removal uh, because there's uh, low production usually. Uh, one of my initial hypotheses, just to give an example of how tough it is to use, use data, we had a hypothesis that the highest yielding areas of a field, uh, assuming it's been just managed farmed normally for the last 100 years, so you go out and spread 100 pounds of fertilizer on the whole field. You know, nobody's had variable rate technology. If you go back 10 years, everybody's just flat rating it, whether it be manure, you, you know, you spread the whole field with manure, you spread the whole field with potash, or, or you don't, or you put down 200 pounds of nitrogen. Everything was basically applied consistently, historically. And um, so if you had an area like this area right along the road here that traditionally yielded very well, the removal would be tremendous. Uh, and it would be, removal would exceed uh, replenishment. And if you had an area, a uh, weaker area, maybe not the top of a knoll, 
because you have erosion, but a weak area maybe back in here where it's relatively flat, just weaker, you wouldn't have the uh, crop removal. So you would have higher nutrient levels back here uh, where the lower crop removal is and lower nutrient levels where the higher crop removal is, assuming flat rate application historically. There was absolutely no correlation to yield and nutrient levels. I mean, it just didn't hold true at all. <laughs> you know, so you think you, you think you got a good, you're on a good track, you know, you're, it's a logical thing, it's reasonable, and uh, there's no correlation. <laughs> so, um, calibration, obviously, yield data, so with that being said, it, we use yield data as a, ba a basis for everything. You know, it's, it's, it's the ground truthing. It's, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the most yield per dollar invested. It's not the most yield. I mean, we could all get tremendous yields if we just put down hundreds of thousands of dollars of fertilizer, our yields would be good. You know, but it, that, we, don't, we don't necessarily care about yield. It's yield per investment or economic return, so. Uh, so calibration's obviously, uh, important and maybe even more important in calibration is consistency. You don't recalibrate halfway through a field as you can readjust and scale, but you can't change if you, if you change the way that the machine is reading within the field. Um, variable rate application, you can, we can basically apply anything variable right now. Uh, we can do seed, fertilizer, lime, chemicals, all sorts of stuff. Here is uh, one of our fields that uh, variable um, application of fertilizer, just showing um, grids that have different rates. We range from three and a half to 500 pounds per acre this particular year, this particular field. So now um, coming back to that multi-variety idea that I mentioned. Uh, this is not one of our fields. It's a relatively good sized field. I'd say it's about 75 acres. Um, he, whoops, sorry. On the right, can't get my tongue to move. On the right here um, is a map of yield that's just color coded for different areas, different kind of ranges. Um, you know, obviously this being the highest, the 210 sort of range. You know, the mid 190s here. There's probably some 180s, 180, 160s. You know, and the red being the lowest. Um, this is the actual yield map here. Um, pass by pass. If we step forward, here's the same map from the right, and then here's those same zones unchanged, same averages, but the colors, the, the pixels on this are, this, sorry, let me back up. This field was planted with a split planter. So half the planter was filled with variety A, half with variety B. Planted back and forth. So if it's a, if it's a 40 foot planter, you got 40 foot swaths of each one. Harvested with a half planter width combine. So it was a 40 foot planter, 20 foot head, uh, so that there was no cross contamination of the varieties. So a uh, good trial, obviously, because it's consistent across the whole field. You got more variety A, B, A, B, A, B, replicated, same seed rate, same fertilizer. So uh, what the pixels are on the right here is the differentiation between the two varieties. With the redder ones being variety, I don't know if it's A or B, let's say variety A, exceeding variety B, the darkest colors of this blue and this red being by 40 bushels or more. <coughs> and the blue being variety B, exceeding variety A by 40 bushels or more. So look at, I mean, you're, you, in this area of the field, you plant the wrong variety, uh, you know, versus here, you're actually looking at an 80 bushel swing on a corn crop. It, it's tremendous. Out of a 160 or 180 bushel total average, obviously that's going high to low you're not going to gain that across the whole field. You know, some of these areas, you know, the variety didn't matter so much. But whether this was a knoll, you know, maybe this was a knoll and this was a valley, so a drier area, wetter area, I don't know the field that's not mine. But if we can start to understand those pro, uh, parameters that drive that response and then place varieties, it's tremendous. So I, I feel pretty strongly about that, obviously. Um, and again, coming back to, I feel the, the only basis for that that we can successfully measure and then use is soil properties. So, uh, you know, understanding crop production, there's all sorts of things that go into play. You know, how to write prescriptions is the tough thing. You know, collecting good data, that's basically what all this stuff is. 
down here, um, field level, you know, uh, GBUs and precipitation. Not much we can do to change that, but it's good to know what it was so that you can look back and analyze your data. Was it a really hot, good growing year? Was it a cold, you know, overcast year? Did we get a lot of rain? Was the rain evenly spaced? Did it all come at once? You know, all those sort of information. And uh, we have all sorts of technology now that's available to us. We can get data on anything. It comes back to the challenge of using it. This is just a Pioneer. I buy a lot of Pioneer seeds, so I don't, it's not meant to lean towards Pioneer. It's just what I know. Uh, I think every company had this. But uh, there's their Pioneer 360 program. And basically, this is every day since we, this is the day we planted right here. This is, uh, I think, rainfall. This is temperature, growing degree units. Uh, you got an average line and then uh, the prior year and the current year. Um, so you can, I mean, you, you know when it rained on every field. This is very high resolution weather data, basically all of this. Uh, taking that to the next step, this is Pioneer's improvement on that for this year. It's, uh, you guys are going to hear about DAPDEN later on. This is Pioneer's N class. It's basically a kind of a takeoff of DAPDEN with a little extra stuff. They have a soil rating stuff. and Anyway, they, you know, have different, this is, again, one of our fields break this field into a bunch of different soil properties. You get set yield goals and you, you uh, applied, we applied variable rate N, P, and K to this so you can factor all that in and then it makes a recommendation. Basically here's a kind of a gas tank of how much nitrogen is left in the soil available to the crop. There um, is, uh, you can pull up another screen here where it kind of plots predicting within the 10 year um, high rainfall, low rainfall kind of has it grayed out and then the average in the middle so you can see where you come out of or stay in the nitrogen availability for your crop. You know, it's predictive models. Uh, so basically the tool for this, and can, we're kind of getting get into the meat of the discussion here now, is, you know, uh, multi-application of nutrients. Placing them correctly, um, stabilizing them in the correct amount, not putting down not just throwing so much nutrients at it that half of them end up in the lakes just so you make sure your corn has enough. It's placing what the crop needs, where it can get to it, when it needs it. And that's where this kind of technology is saying um, is helping with that. So what the idea would be is to run this, uh, and we did about a week or two ago, uh, get its recommendation. Uh, you see in these darker green areas, um, it's, uh, I believe the green is full, moderate, low. So we are in the moderate, the predominantly this field was in the moderate area. We had none in the low. We did not go back and reapply it. The average when we ran this two weeks ago, and look at the, the rainfall, 16 inches of rain since planting. Um, but when we ran this at the time, the drop tube, uh, this particular program said we needed six pounds on average for the entire field with a high of 20 and a lot of zeros. So it, was not, it did not justify the cost to um, go back in and reapply at that point. So uh, five minutes. Uh oh. Uh, so anyway, it's some technology that allows us to, to predict where we are with our nutrients uh, based on uh, as applied information. So. Um, so how this all applies to climate change, you know, I guess I, the basis for me and what I try and do in my farm is, is really trying to understand what we're working with, what potential, where our soil is. You know, what is our nutrient holding capacity of that soil? Um, what's its water holding capacity? What's its um, yield potential? Uh, and what, what different characteristics, you know, that soil has. Once I kind of get a feel for that, you know, I'm going to, say, well, we have some fields that we know it has very little EC. It's a measure of electric conductivity, about an amount of unbound negative nuclei on the soil. So basically, it's ability to hold water, nutrients, and all that stuff. So if it's real low, there's no sense of throwing a bunch of uh, nutrients at it. We're going to saturate the soil, and they're going to you know, leach into the, the groundwater and whatnot. Uh, so we have some predominantly sand on our farm that has really low EC and we go in and apply three times. We apply nitrogen three times on that farm. And if we do that and get it rain, it, it produces a wonderful crop. If we put it all up front, half of it would be gone. You know, other areas we know that there's basically an endless ability for the soil to hold nutrients, whether it be water, fertilizer, or whatnot. 
and we're more likely to put it up front then. Uh, placement. Placement's obviously crucial. We have in New York a lot of glacial sedimentary, sedimentary soils. We don't get real good rooting depth. We don't get real good lateral movement in our roots. So you can only use what nutrients the plant can access and what the area of it access is roots. That's why I mentioned I went to 20 inch rows. You extend out the plant spacing and you narrow the rows. So if you draw a circle around each plant, you know, whatever this, if it's a nine inch seed spacing, you draw a nine inch circle because that's when it would interfere with the next plant and measure the percent of the soil covered by roots. Uh, it's much greater on a narrow row with wider seed spacing than a wider row with narrower seed spacing. So, you know, accessing it. And if, if we're focused on that, then I need to be putting the nutrients in that band, not in an area that's not accessible. The non accessible nutrients obviously are not accessible. So, um, I guess that's kind of the gist of, of how I feel we manage climate change crop production is understanding what we have to work with and then employing any sort of technology. I went over a bunch of things that we kind of have available to us to set us up to succeed no matter if we get one inch of rain or 10 inches of rain or a lot of sun or no sun, give us the best chance of that. And it's going to be very different across all of our fields and within a field tremendously. So. I kind of had to cut it short at the end. Is there much of uh, questions? Yes. Yeah. 